Okay. Uh, are we good to go? Everyone took their coffee break and smoke break? Okay. 여러분, 안녕하십니까? 저는 저 DFSB Collective 대표이사님 Bernie Cho. Uh, it's a huge honor and pleasure to be on stage with this League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I don't think you'll find anywhere in the world this type of uh, successful trio of serial startup visionaries. Um, they are the movers and shakers behind some of the most disruptive digital media services in the world. Um, I'll start off with the gentleman right next to me, Andreas N., who, uh, between shuttling back and forth between his hometown of uh, Sweden, or country Sweden, and former hometown of San Francisco, has worn many hats over the past decade, from a tech journalist to an international angel investor, and with a special talent for spotting unicorns in the wild, one of the companies he was involved with intimately and in the beginning was the multi-billion dollar music streaming service known as Spotify, where he served as not only a co-founder, but also the original CTO. To his right, we have Sam Wick, who in LA, in the entertainment, media, and tech space, is arguably probably as badass as John Wick. Um, a former Sony Music executive, a former MySpace executive, He's currently the EVP and GM over at Makers Studios. For those of you who don't know Makers Studios, their numbers are absolutely impressive. Not only are they the number one YouTube multi-channel network, but, and I have to read the numbers because they, they pop out, 55,000 creator partners in over 100 plus countries, 650 plus million subscribers, and over 10 billion views a month. Now, why and how do these numbers add up? Well, they added up very nicely last year as Walt Disney bought Maker Studios for a cool $500 million. And last but not least, we have Mark Randolph, who in his various roles as a board member, mentor, and advisor to many startups, he's arguably probably the Gandalf of Silicon Valley. And among his many accomplishments, among many of the companies he's led to successful IPOs, uh, was a movie streaming service that we all know and love, known as Netflix. Uh, Mark was not only one of the co-founders, but he was also the original CEO. So a round of applause for everybody up here. I was a little thrown off by the title of this particular panel. Movies, I get it. Music, I get it. Mayhem, definitely true. But what does the future hold for these industries? No one knows. And so what I want to do is before we talk about the future, I'd like to sort of dip back and talk a little bit about the past. Um, basically, before there's Spotify, music was all about buying D, uh, CDs or digital downloads. Before there was a Netflix. Um, movies at Home was all about renting DVDs, and before there was Maker Studios, when we talked about entertainment content or show development, we weren't talking about Maker Studios, we were talking about TV studios. Now, for each of you, what was sort of that epiphany moment where you said, this is it, this is going to be the next best thing, and why that moment helped you basically commit, not yourself professionally, but also personally, to building the companies that you previously were at. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Andreas, because we'll go from A through W. So Andreas, Spotify. Sure, thank you. Um, well, I think, I think it was pretty clear to all of us who were involved in the early days that um, the access model for, for media, in our case music, um, was in many ways, uh, if not always, superior to the previous like ownership or download model where you had to spend so much time just keeping track of and managing your content and potentially buying it over and over for various devices, um, as opposed to just have a single place where you have a username and a password, you log in and you get access to your content wherever you are um, from any device. I think that made a lot of sense to us. Um, the open question was, of course, how can we do this in a way that works legally and commercially? And that was the big challenge, I would say, with Spotify beyond just sort of technically building the product and the distribution mechanism and all of that. Okay. And Mark, um, when you started at Netflix, what was sort of the moment you realized this is going to be not only different, but it's going to be very disruptive service? And, you know, mind you, it's been 20 years now since you were first with Netflix. 
Um, obviously, a lot has changed in the past 20 years, but when you, of all the other startups you were involved with, why did you commit to Netflix, and what was the moment when you guys realized this business model could not only work but succeed? So as I, was saying, as I said before, it, there was a lot of struggle here. And part of the problem is that we picked a crazy business. We picked one where we said we would ship a piece of plastic halfway across the country, return it, buy the inventory, and do that all for like three or four dollars. And it turned out, of course, to be impossible. And so we had involuntarily started into a business which we lost money on every disc we rented and got the more successful you are, the deeper a hole you dig yourself into. And I think one of the big breakthroughs was finally the movie studios began to recognize that there might actually be something here that worked for them. And they all of a sudden, one after another, began giving us very favorable terms on buying content from them. And what that did was completely transform our business model and not only open up our ability to do new things like our unlimited rental program, but actually begin to invest forward. And you could clearly see, if you look back, this inflection point where it plugged along like so, and then all of a sudden kicked up. And there was this kind of moment, not only we saw economic success, but it was like, we have respect from the big boys. And that was kind of very, very gratifying. And Sam? Yeah, for us, um, one of the interesting things that I, you know, that I believe fundamentally about a company like Maker is that when content platforms change, uh, content changes with it. So if you think in, in the video industry and you think about movies versus broadcast TV and then to cable and then to digital, and it felt a few years ago, uh, 2009, when we started Maker, that we were in the middle of another fundamental shift. And this post, in this post-digital era, content was going to be socially shared it, it was not going to rely on an electronic programming guide, right? It was going to be shorter. It was going to be consumed via multiple devices. All of this was new. And if you look at the history of media, what you'll see is that typically companies that succeed in one media format then have trouble making the jump to the, ne the next stage. And so we've seen this in mediums, for example, movie companies buying television companies, television companies buying digital companies. I felt the same thing was going to happen at Maker, and we've definitely seen that. And in terms of the, the inflection point, it was really when the numbers in terms of the consumption, we talked about 10 billion, but it was when we were much, much smaller, the numbers became bigger than what traditional television and movie companies and studios had seen in terms of their audience. And at that point, what they saw was, I may not understand the type of content that, that this youth audience, the millennial audience, wants to consume, but the numbers were so undeniably large that they had a desire to understand that, and that was a true inflection point for us. The next question I have is, um, when you guys envisioned your respective companies, and today obviously we saw a lot of demos where good ideas by the time they go to market may actually evolve or become something very different. So for instance, Andreas, what was the original sort of version of Spotify and how did it differ than what came to market? And more importantly, how does it differ to the service we know and love today? Um, I, think, I think it differs in, in two major ways. Um, and, and most so because the initial thoughts around Spotify was actually not specifically music. We wanted to do a video service, so a Netflix type of service. Um, and to, to, you know, with all respect to Netflix, no one has really done a Spotify for movies yet. Um, Netflix is amazing, and the other movie streaming services are also, but no one has that sort of breadth and depth of catalog. No one has that service where you can go and watch your favorite 80s show or you know, a movie from the 30s or the latest Hollywood blockbuster because no one is willing to license that. Um, and I guess we realized that no one was anytime soon, and it was difficult enough to try to do that for music, so we focused on that, which I think was, uh, I don't think the company would have been around if we hadn't made that decision. Um, the other major change was that initially we weren't um, planning to have a paid service at all. We, we thought, this was like almost 10 years ago, so the willingness for of people to pay for things online, um, especially outside of the US, was much, much lower than it is today, so we kind of always assumed it has to be free to work, and it was always going to be ad-funded, and um, ultimately the premium version came along, but that was the original plan. Um, Mark, in terms of uh, sort of that pivot moment where you basically collectively decided that this current path might not be the way to go, what was sort of the um, epiphany? You mentioned, like some people, when it comes to a pivot, it's based on data. For others, it's a gut feeling. 
in your case, what was sort of that deciding factor that made Netflix what it is really today? I'm, I'm, I really don't think there was any single one point where we got it right. And uh, people, uh, today it would be very difficult to do what we did there because we raised a ton of money and were given many, many opportunities to get it wrong. And it was one swing after another. It really came when we all of a sudden were just about out of money and decided to bet it all on doing an, a subscription business. And for some reason, subscriptions resonated. And back then, there was not a lot of subscription businesses, and it was a big gamble to force people into this. And we forced them. We did not give them the choice. We switched overnight and said, well, here goes. It's either going to work or it's not going to work. And Sam, um, we were talking backstage when Maker Studio started. It actually was really a studio space. How did you guys evolve into what you are today? What was sort of that pivotal moment that made Makers what it is? Right. So um, the company, as you mentioned, was a studio when it initially started. And maybe they, there's about, about maybe less than 100 individual creators who were signed, and every single piece of content was, was produced actually at the studio itself. And it was the, the introduction of technology and the investment in technology early and with a real focus on scaling faster than our competition that was the true differentiator for us. Um, the next question I had, we'll, we'll come back to Andreas again. Um, you know, obviously when you were starting with Spotify, um, were there any other companies out there out of the box that you were either inspired by or, or perhaps even benchmarking. Um, when you guys were thinking of Spotify, what sort of drove you to say, that's our Pied Piper? Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I think um, the answer may surprise you. Um, there are two, two great, well-known global media online services have come out of Stockholm, Sweden. One of them is Spotify, and the other is uh, the Pirate Bay. Um, which at least for a time, for a long time, was the biggest um, torrent tracker and file sharing platform on the planet. Um, it was eventually shut down and resurrected many times over. But um, I think, and I think, I think that's an important, um, important point that we, we actually use that um, as a benchmark. So I think a lot of a reason why a lot of, of previous commercial and licensed music services had failed, or at least not gained any huge traction, was because a lot of them were, were started by industry insiders. A lot of them, they just, piracy was not something that they wanted to compare themselves to. They just think, well, that's illegal. We're going to shut it down. That's not our benchmark. Um, we were, I guess, a new generation. Everyone was listening to music online, but no one was paying for it. So we figured if we want to provide a commercial license service that's somehow as monetizable, then we need to figure out a way to be better than piracy. And I don't think anyone had really tried to be better than piracy before. Everyone just said, well, you know, we're legal, and that's reason enough. But it isn't for people. Um, hence, the intense focus on speed, for example, in the beginning. Um, prior to Spotify, streaming was something that people um, connected to user experience, such as real networks, where you'd be buffering and buffering, and eventually sound would start coming out of your speakers. We wanted every song to start within 200 milliseconds. Um, it should be as fast, if not faster, than having the music locally on your computer. And so like fast and that, that sort of immediate access was a way for us to, to have a better user experience than piracy. And that was our benchmark. And, and Sam, um, in your instance, what was the inspiration or benchmark? Right. So it, it, we, we discussed this a bit backstage, but this is a, a tricky one because we actually didn't have anyone to, to benchmark against. We were, in some sense, we were in a completely new industry. And um, what we, we found is that we were, you know, we were organized as a media company, so our primary revenue source is, is advertising. And so what we needed to do was shift dollars. Right? We knew there were tons of dollars available and that there were categories like newspapers and print magazines that were receiving far more than their fair share. And there were digital dollars that were being spent. And so we really needed to benchmark not necessarily the company as a whole, but in specific categories. So for example, in advertising, we needed to show that, that our rate of return in buying media from us and the, the value of uh, what's called a native integration, like having a talent create the advertising content themselves, would be more effective. So it was actually less looking at the business category as a whole, because we were, we were convinced that, a, that the wind was at our backs and that as our industry continued to grow, dollars were going to shift. But we had to figure out how we're going to tell that story in individual pockets and move that along faster. 
and, and Mark? Uh, it was unquestionably Amazon. Uh, at the time, e-commerce was nascent. People were not selling things online. And Amazon was an inspiration. At the time, it was only selling books, if you can imagine such a world. And I said to myself that my net, the startup that I do is finding something that I can sell online. And I absolutely modeled it on early Amazon. Okay. And um, the next question I have is, obviously with startups, there are going to be some highs, some lows, some hearts broken, and some, and some uh, egos broken along the way. But were there any sort of failures, fiascos, disasters that turned out to be blessings in disguise, learning experiences that hopefully led to you guys building a bigger, but more importantly, better service? Yeah, uh, I'll just share one just generally, and it's not just, I, I'll share this experience not just from Maker, but uh, pretty much all of the startups that I've done is that when you build a company that starts from a handful of people and grows to being sold for, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or goes public, one of the biggest things to challenge is actually the, the team fit. And we heard teamwork stated a number of times earlier is one of the kind of main investment criteria, but actually managing the dynamics between a team and managing kind of hyper growth and kind of knowing when someone is good at the beginning, right, and they serve many different roles, to then when you actually need to organize and focus people and motivating the team through that, and also knowing when certain people can't make that transition is a big fundamental kind of management challenge and can lead to some of your highest highs when the team's coming together, but can also lead to some of your lowest lows when you realize that someone is not able to make that shift. And Andreas, in your instance? Um, I think, I think I'll, I'll use an example, not from Spotify, but from uh, the company that I co-founded after uh, Spotify, which is called Rap, and uh, is still around. It's in, it's in um, offers distribution or you know, customer acquisition for bricks and mortar retailers. Uh, we had launched the first version of the service in Sweden only, in the the fall of 2011 and in february 2012 we were cloned by rocket internet the summer brothers a german clone factory that that has made it its business model to do that and it came as a bit of a shock for us because we were still early stage and we didn't really have a proven business model we thought but we'd raised a lot of money from prominent investors and we had gotten a lot of press so they thought it was something they cloned us um and they, they were super vocal about how they were going to scale this out globally and they were going to launch it in 30 countries. Remember, we were only in one at the point. So um, we, we figured we have to do something to fight back. So within three months, we had um, people actually like feet on the ground in 18 countries. Um, and that was, that was um, super crazy. It cost a lot of money. We burned through cash like there was no tomorrow. Uh, and it was a huge distraction to the company. And I think we should have just sort of let them try to figure things out on their own because, you know, ultimately a lot of things weren't yet figured out. Instead, we went head on against them and burned through too much cash and, and more importantly, lost focus on what we actually wanted to do. And Mark? Uh, so my example of a failure that had a silver lining uh, in, I think it was 2000, 2001, we were on track to lose about $50 million that year and decided that, as the expression is, discretion, better part of valor, that we would try and sell the company. And we decided to try and sell it to Blockbuster. But they wouldn't take our calls. And uh, we were at a corporate retreat. Um, and this being a very casual company, when it goes on retreat, it's even more casual. So I had packed nothing except for shorts and sandals and maybe a tank top or something like that. And I hope underwear as well? Yeah, I had underwear. But I did have a fake Harley Davidson tattoo because I wanted my team, when I took my shirt off to go swimming, to, to think I had a real Harley Davidson tattoo. But anyway, so we're at this retreat and Blockbuster calls and says, we'll meet with you. And we go, oh no. And so we ended up having to charter a private plane and flew to Dallas, and we're in this conference room in this big building, and I'm in my shorts and a tank top with a Harley Davidson tattoo, and we proposed they buy us for $50 million. And they, uh, they laughed at us and sent us home packing. And at the time, we thought, we're toast, that's the end, we're done. But of course, it turned out to be probably the best thing that could have happened to us at that time, because we then focused on kicking their ass. 
Awesome. And um, as things are sort of winding down, I think really for a lot of the startups here who are looking you know, to you guys for inspiration, um, what do you right now perceive to be the biggest challenge, but more importantly, the biggest opportunity um, in your respective spaces? So, you know, in, for instance, with Sam at Maker Studio, what do you feel is the biggest challenge and also your biggest opportunity? Yeah, in, in some sense, they're the same. Um, you know, because for us, it's really managing hypergrowth. We're, we're a company that's essentially um, grown very, very rapidly, right? You know, from an employee perspective, um, in five years, we've grown to, to over 400 employees. Uh, all the other metrics are, are quite similar in terms of their growth. So managing hypergrowth is, is a very kind of unique challenge. Um, in terms of the opportunity, what we're seeing is that how content is, is consumed um, and not just video content, but all, but all content, is changing very, very rapidly. And what the music industry, I think, has taught us is, is when an inflection point occurs, the change after that is very, very rapid. And so I believe we're seeing something you know, very kind of compelling and something very interesting in the video space. Um, and Maker represents that, and, and that's why we're seeing such a large audience number. But we believe that, that will continue to move into the traditional media space and you know, why we've been able to announce deals globally with, with major media partners who are distributing our content and we're also kind of creating unique content for them, including Globe uh, here in Asia. And, and Andreas? Um, well, well, I think two things. Um, not necessarily in the field of, of music streaming or media, but, but one of them, uh, which I think is at the same time the biggest challenge and the biggest um, opportunity, or the biggest risk and the biggest opportunity that humanity has ever faced is um, AI. It was Artificial on, intelligence. Yeah, it was touched on briefly during the robot session, but it's, it's going to be huge in one way or another, I, I believe firmly. Um, when it comes to AI, are you sort of pro-AI, anti-AI? What's sort of your kind of projection? I'm, I'm, I'm pro-AI. Um, I think I think the best the best um, opportunity we have is to to use it for our benefit um, or or like use it to improve ourselves and, and kind of follow the machines through that singularity that that phase of hyper growth. Um, the other kind of a little bit more prosaic, I guess, is um, blockchain technology. So the underlying technology um, of Bitcoin. Which is which is actually like a globally distributed um, database with, uh, which lets you share trust without um, the involved parties having to, to trust any you know single point. So there's a lot of things beyond just currency that you can build on that, and there's hundreds of startups working on it. Okay. And and Mark, you know now that you've shifted gear over the years from being a co-founder to really being a fan and, and a consumer of Netflix, uh, what do you see as sort of the biggest challenge and, and the biggest opportunity? Uh, you know, as Sam said, it, it, they're the same for Netflix, I think. I mean, one of the things about starting a company is each time you crest a hill, you climb so hard and you get the summit, you realize it's just a bigger hill beyond it. And, it, you know, you, you're successful, but then all of a sudden you've got to fight off Blockbuster, then you've got to fight off Amazon, then you've got to fight off Comcast. And I think what's happening is content is changing so quickly before, there was a nice clear line between you were a content producer or you were a content distributor. And now the producers want to be distributors, the distributors want to be producers. And that's going to be a very, very different world for Netflix. And they will not be able to go in and just spend money to win there. They have to be smart about it. And I think we'll find out whether the investment that we made many, many, many years ago in deep personalization and understanding so much about the customer is enough to help them win the uh, content wars. And to uh, come very close to winding down, when you started at Makers or at Spotify or at Netflix, did you guys have a vision of what the company could become five, ten years from now? And how was that vision changed or did it stay on course? Basically, was there a prediction that you mentally made inside your head that went terribly right or perhaps terribly wrong, or terribly different? Uh, you know, f for me, it, it happened much faster than we were expecting. I think that, um, and that's because when, as I mentioned before, when, when you hit certain inflection points, things like consumption behavior was dramatically increasing. And so for us, that allowed us to accelerate and move much, much faster. I think the other thing that we've seen that we weren't necessarily expecting is kind of the, the overall kind of growth of 
video platforms. So it's not necessarily that, well, our business was kind of born out of kind of YouTube. There are now multiple platforms, um, you know, in, in the U.S., you know, Vine for comedy in short, short form, Twitch for gaming. But we're seeing this globally, um, different platforms in different countries um, rising as well, and all of those kind of creating different types of, uh, of content. So that, that is also a fundamental shift that we hadn't necessarily planned for five years ago, but our business has done a very good job in adapting uh, to. And Andreas, what was completely unexpected when you started Spotify and what you see it now today that you just had no idea would happen? Um, well, we didn't, we didn't first, so to, to put it in perspective, um, the company was started in 2006. Um, before the first iPhone was released. So we didn't foresee, and I think very few did, we didn't foresee exactly how ubiquitous smartphones would, be, would become, or like how, how big part of our life they would be. People already had smartphones, but they weren't any good. So they weren't used to it. So we didn't, we didn't realize that was going to be the primary market for such a service as Spotify. We, we, I think we came around pretty, pretty fast, but that wasn't something that we could have planned before. Um, the thing, the other thing is I think we kind of, you can look at it now, it has 75 million um, users, 20 million paying subscribers and say that it's grown quickly, but I think we all probably expected it to grow much faster and, and grow, growth has been constrained by the content industry. So, you know, had, had they been more forthcoming, Spotify could probably be 10 times the size it is now in terms of users. Okay, and Mark, the unexpected. It, if you had asked, if you had told me back when we were just 15 people in a little office waiting for our first order that at one point we would be 60 million subscribers and in 50 countries and referred to on television and I would never in a million years have, uh, have believed you. I mean, we, when I was trying to convince employees to join way back when, I would say things like, someday this stock will be worth $100 and they'd say, how can you bullshit, my people, my other guys go, how can you bullshit, bullshit someone like that? And I, 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 but I said, it's not bullshit if you believe it yourself. But I never could have imagined what happened, would have happened. So, so the bullshit served as fertilizer. Okay. <laughs> In this case. All right. Well, we have a few minutes left, and I'd like to leave it out here. So if there's anybody that has any questions, uh, please raise your hand, and uh, we'll have a microphone. 혹시 질문 있으시면. Uh, over there. Uh, uh, could you state your name and, and your question, please? 네, 저는 박성민이고요. 네, 그리고 네, 어, 좋은 창업자가 되거나 아니면은 지금 많이 스타트업에서 많이 오셨으니까 어, I guess you guys don't have a, any uh, translator in, like translator, right? Uh, yeah, I, I can translate the question. Yeah. Oh, okay. 한국말을 right. 하시면 저는 네, 번역으로 해 드릴게요. 네. 그래서 음, 좋은 인베스터가 되기 위한 세 가지 뭐 팁? 그리고 어, 좋은 어, 투자자를 만나기 위한 세 가지 팁을 알수 있다면 어떤 게 있을까요? Okay. So this is a question really for all three of you. Um, it's really more related as uh, from an investment standpoint. Um, what kind of tips would you give to, say, companies that are pitching to you from an investment standpoint, and vice versa, as an investor, uh, what do you look for in companies? Um, so uh, the first thing, so I work with uh, a number of different accelerators, uh, and the, at the, let's say, the C to the A stage, um, the first thing I look for is uh, a strong founding team. Um, and because you make the assumption that um, there may be a pivot that the company has to make, right? Particularly if they're very, very early in, in their business before it uh, achieves traction. And the question that I always ask myself is, is this team gonna be smart enough, one, to kind of uh, make that adjustment, see when the business model is working or is not working, and, and know when to move? And two, do they have the type of relationship with each other that they can actually ride that out? Um, because many companies fail or have really struggle in that early stage because of the, the, the founder issues. Um, and then the, the second thing, uh, I'll tell you one thing I, I don't really look at, which is um, growth projections. Um, 
I, I, what I want to see is that the, the founder has actually done the work that they understand the market, right? Because they're probably going to spend five, ten years on this business, and I want to know that they understand it from a, a basic perspective and that they're passionate about it, but whether or not, you know, they tell me that it's going to be a hundred million dollar business or a two hundred million dollar business, I'm not that concerned about that because I'm not investing in that later stage. We're looking at the, the early stages of the business. And, and Andreas? Well, I, I want to second the team part, obviously, um, like looking for passionate founders. Um, but also, also what, that the problem that they're addressing is actually big enough that it's a problem that needs solving badly enough that, that there's actually going to be a market for this. And um, thirdly, I do look a lot at the product, even though I probably shouldn't, because it, it, in all likelihood, it's going to change. But that's because I'm more of a product guy myself, so I tend to do that. Okay. And Mark? Professional investors invest in the economics, and they're willing to tolerate jerks. And then angel investors invest because they like the founder. And I absolutely invest in companies that I like the founders. Uh, I like to get involved. And I, so the most important thing is, do you have this two-pronged personality? Incredibly strong belief in yourself, but you're willing to listen. And that's fairly rare. Okay. We'll take one more question, and we'll wrap things up. Um, right here. Uh, 어 제가 정말 케빈 스페이시 빅 정말 휴즈 팬이거든요. I'm big fan of Kevin Spacey. And I have question to Mark Randolph. Uh, and I have a problem actually. After watching House of Cards, I become more hate, hating the politics. So I want to ask you, there is a hidden, hidden message Netflix <laughs> want to deliver to public. So really, politician is really better like Kevin Spacey in that show. That's all you, Mark. So uh, I'm going to cop out and say, it's entertainment. <laughs> okay. And to close on this theme, I think many of you obviously love music, watch movies. And really, over the past two, three years, we've actually seen a lot of movies come out out of Silicon Valley. Um, we've had The Social Network which was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Soundtrack, actually won the Academy Award for Best Soundtrack. Uh, Steve Jobs and Apple doesn't have one now, they're gonna have two movies coming out. And I don't know if we can count the internship as a Google movie, per se, but if they were to make a movie about Maker Studios, the founding of Spotify, and the early days of Netflix, who would you guys pick as the actor to play you? Uh, well, there's already been John Wick. Maybe Keanu wants to take another run at the Wicks. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I have no idea. I, I know almost zero actors. <laughs> okay. And Mark? So we actually play this game all the time. All right. <laughs> but, and I will point out as a quick thing, there, there's a phenomenally good book about the early days of Netflix, which is exhaustively researched, and it's kind of a very compelling story. And I believe it's in Korean now. But to answer the question, I would like to be played by Jonah Hill. But not the, jo the money ball Jonah Hill, not the, um, not the other Jonah Hill. Not the, 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 what is it, the Wolf of Wall Street Jonah Hill? That's not a bad Jonah Hill either. Okay, fair enough. Thank you so much, everybody. And a round of applause for our, our esteemed trio. Kamsam <laughs> Nida.